Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. And today we're joined by our colleague Matthew Feeney. So between the three of us in this room right now are four philosophy degrees, which if you ask around is about the most useless degree out there. Obviously, all three of us disagree not just because of sunk costs. We disagree in part because philosophy is so embedded in what we do here at Cato. In fact, here's Cato's mission statement. The Cato Institute is a public policy research organization dedicated to the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace. Now, all of these ideas have their foundations in and are motivated by philosophical principles. To talk about them means to talk and to think philosophically. But what do we mean when we think philosophically? Matt, Theo, I'll let you answer that. Uh, well, you know, I, I like that we start with the uh, the small questions. On <laughs> uh, but I think uh, when, when I think about what it means to think philosophically, I think of you know when I was starting out at university and what I think made philosophy different from a lot of the other subjects that people were studying. And for me, that was the study of the structure of arguments and fallacies and uh, the rhetoric and things like that. And that really did seem to set it apart uh, from humanities. Uh, and it's funny that philosophy seems to get this reputation for being a little wishy-washy when it is actually a discipline that does teach real clear uh, and structured thinking. As long as we're not speaking about critical theory or Derrida or right. <laughs> well, French but, postmodernists or along these lines. See, this is – Aaron has this history of a, having a too high of a esteem for French postmodernists. I had to beat it out of him. It's undergrad. terrific stuff when you're trying to study a poem that's six exactly. lines long. Exactly. <laughs> Last week, we did an episode with Professor Andrew Cohen on applying philosophy to public policy on his new book on that topic. And when it was posted to Facebook, the some of the comments that we got were, of course, we shouldn't think philosophically. Like what philosophy that the argument goes, philosophy basically is either just talking for the sake of talking, it's not very productive, um, or it confuses more than it clarifies. And so the argument was like, look, what we, we don't need philosophy. What we need is pragmatic thinking and we need to – I think as one person said, we need to just apply the laws that exist and not worry about thinking about what they should be or moral principles or whatever else. And so in response to that, I mean does philosophy – it certainly can confuse more than clarify. I mean the, the history of philosophy is the history of, yeah, that's not a very good answer to that question and here's why. Um, but well, well, it seems is, like is that a, is that a Genuine knock against it? That seems like a semantics question to some degree. The uh, the question of one sort of I guess this would be kind of trolling answer to that to that statement is that they've stated a philosophy without even knowing it. They've stated a philosophy of pragmatism, or they've mm -hmm. stated a, that we need to have applied philosophies, and we need we need fewer angels dancing on a head of a pin type of questions, and more questions about what do I do next? And maybe that's the most important philosophical question: is what do I do next? In terms of an existential, ethical kind of mandate for living your life. Well, uh, I, I think a good follow up on these you know sort of. Facebook discussions is well. You are really having what you know we we think at the heart is an ethical conversation um, when we talk about policy. So um, we can get economists uh, to talk about uh, the effects of the war on drugs, for example, something that is uh, expensive and maybe inefficient. Uh, but that's a different uh, sort of question to is the war on drugs moral. And is it a worthwhile policy to pursue? Uh, and you know, in at Cato, we have uh, economists and we have political scientists, and uh, people are engaged in answering different kinds of questions that are all very, very uh, important to the mission. Um, although I know, like Aaron said earlier, it's very difficult to detach, uh, you know, political theory and moral theory. One is a subsection of the other. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that sometimes drives me nuts about economists um, is is the the thought that what is being done when you're doing economics is somehow distanced from philosophy, from moral questions, from political questions. That it's a philosophical. I mean, I um, a few years back, I was in the little kitchen room where we get coffee on the sixth floor at Cato, and a colleague who's now moved on to other things, but was an extremely prominent and extremely talented and skilled economist, came in and asked me what I do at Cato um, and I said I run libertarianism.org and he didn't – it didn't really know exactly what that meant. So I said, well, I do, I do political philosophy stuff, intellectual history, libertarianism ideas and he looked at me um, and he said, I, I understand that there are people out there who do that but 
I guess I don't understand why. Um, because it just what's what's the point of having these conversations? What matters is look, we can add up the effects of these policies, and we can look at how much it costs, what its effect on GDP is, the, you know, the cost curves over time, and that's that's what matters. But I think the point that we're trying to make is that even even assessing those sorts of things demands first having a framework in which to evaluate them. Like, why does it matter that this costs? more than that? How do we weigh the effects against each other? Are there certain costs that we shouldn't bear no matter how much good stuff we get out of them? Well, for me, the, the, the value of philosophy has, has always been trying to achieve some sort of rigor in what you're talking about and how you're discussing it. Um, I often say that there's only three philosophical questions which are what is there, how do I know about it and what do I do about it? So let's start with the first one. So, so <laughs> let me describe all the things in the universe. So the question of what sort of things there are uh, would be a metaphysics question and where those things reside. So you kind of have a question. A, a classic one would be, you know, is something actually a color? Like, is it actually green, or is it is the is the green being put onto a thing by your brain? Where is the greenness lie in the world? Where where is it? Where is it? It does something actually smell bad? Does a dead body actually smell bad, or is that just your perception? Where is that in the world? Metaphysics is also where the the big question of does God exist yes. falls with. Yes, or as my my dad always used to say, it's the study of what's really 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 real. Um, at the end of the day, and then in epistemology is the, it was how would you know these things about the world? Uh, Kant famously uh, sort of assumed through negation that there was a world out there that he couldn't know anything about, but there was just something out there, uh, the noumenal world. And then the ethics question is: Okay, now you have a metaphysics component, an epistemological component, and then you have an ethics component, which is what do I do about it? Is there any normative element? But this is important for any discussion of anything. Um, whether it's a kind of party discussion with a, a hippie girl who is talking about crystal healing and and you're trying to figure out what she's saying about anything or whether it's a, someone on TV talking about political rhetoric saying that these things are true about people or these things are true about ethics or morals or freedom or fairness or all these things, trying to figure out what it means to say fairness, trying to parse out the language. When you say fair, what does it mean when you're saying fair and trying to make sure that we're clear about what we're disagreeing about or agreeing about? And that's often what the most productive element of philosophy is. Yeah, um, I think anyone who's seen cable news will see, uh, even though the participants on these, you know, what are called debates, uh, might not the might shouting be, shows. The shouting shows, Peter right? But um, it, it strikes me as very often you, you just, you're seeing two people who have very different conceptions about how, what human beings are and how they act and what their role in the world should be, and also um, how people who how their government can morally. Um, govern their behavior. Uh, but it's never you know, couched that way and oftentimes I hope that people would take a bit more time to consider uh, their prior assumptions on all of these things because they do matter when it comes to policy, uh, you know, especially on you know, the so-called social issues, things about you know, what we should eat and what we can consume and who should we, we should be allowed to sleep with or marry and uh, who we should be able to hire to do our gardening. All these things have philosophical foundations that ought to be examined. When, when we talk about this, I mean, Trevor, you just mentioned all these things that came under metaphysics, like what is green, and this raises the question of what I mean. What does that have to do with policy? So the, the issue is we're, we talk we are talking about philosophy as both it's a body of knowledge, you know, knowledge of what people have said green is from the ancient Greeks to today, and then it's a set of tools, which is the same as you know science. Science there's a scientific method, and then there's also the Various things that physicists have discovered over the years, and are they are they separable? Is the question because what exactly green is doesn't seem very applicable to the kind of debates we have in Washington. Whereas, I mean, maybe the the questions of what sort of respect do we owe to people, why, what things matter when we're adding up the effects of policies, what's government allowed to do or not do, these moral theories, those seem to matter. But are the the tools themselves, the you know, thinking abstractly or defining our terms or knowing what we're talking about, are those separable from the thousands of years of content? Well, I th um, I, to use an example uh, for a, a guest we had on previously on Free Thoughts, Michael Humer, uh, who argues about 
the sort of strangeness of the state being allowed to do things that normal people aren't allowed to do. But his theory is is based off of – as a philosopher, his theory is based off of uh, at the beginning his metaphysics of where he thinks morality is, which he thinks is in the world. And that's a maybe sounds like a strange thing. Uh, I think most people think that morality is in our head. He thinks that it's in the world in some meaningful sense, in the same way that dogs and planes and Donald Trump are in the world, or laws of or physics, laws of physics that you can intuit, and that matters to some extent. I mean, it, it, but the interesting thing is, his argument is is just sort of says the presumption is is that when you see something is wrong, it's probably wrong. Right. And he has a but very this is, I mean, this is a weird thing to say that. about. Morality to some extent because what it what it means is if morality exists in the world, whether it's the the kind of thing, whether it's an entity in the world like your dogs and colors and whatever else. It's Donald Trump. World, everything right? this week is Donald Trump. Yes. Um, <laughs> most of what we're saying may not apply to Donald Except Trump. Of course he's kind not. Of, of he's, course he's his not. own yes, thing yeah. out there. But, um, but that's different from say the laws of mathematics and we can say – we can think that – you know, two plus two equals four, whether we exist or not. But to say murder is wrong, or res you know, moral beings are owed respect, or whatever, in the absence of people. So to, it to take it outside weird. of our own yeah. head seems seems odd. It could be odd. Um, it also might be the way the world is. Um, the world might just be very strange and that's an, always a possibility. Even, you, it, it, even things that seem very strange like the fact that brains think um, might just be the kind of thing that brains do. That's just uh, – electric eels make electricity. That seems pretty really, really weird to me and brains think. So they, they kind of do these things together. But, that, but that's you know, maybe a cop-out. But they, I'm not a specialist in moral metaphysics. But another example of when this stuff comes up is, is Kantian arguments come up a lot even without people understanding them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be I guess – it's sort of, we're getting kind of simplistic to say where does Kant think moral truths lie, but the categorical imperative of formulating something for rational beings to act on as if it were a universal law, that's probably the most common argument I hear for voting, for example. Very explicit. If I say I don't vote, they say, well, if, if everyone did that, then we'd have a problem. And they're kind of invoking the categorical. Yeah, or even I mean, the, the golden rule is a variant mm -hmm. of that. The do unto others as you'd have them do under you says like if you're gonna if you do this thing, you know, is this something you would want everyone doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we start we start there. We start with uh, most people don't like to examine their premises. It kind of upsets people a lot of time to ask them something like, why can't you sell babies? Or parental rights. Well, I mean, the, things like this. I think the the frustration might might um, occur at least in Washington is that if you're at a house party or if you're at a bar, you can you can talk to someone for an hour and then eventually, be, yeah, I guess we're talking past each other, or I guess we'll agree to disagree, or I guess. But um, two senators can't sit opposite a table and say, well, I guess we have different uh, moral assumptions about the way the world works. Let's go vote differently on the bill. Like these are, you maybe know, maybe they I think do say that. Sometimes. They might. I would be stunned, but I would also, I mean, this is a great you know image to think of Elizabeth Warren and Rand Paul talking about Kantian ethics. I don't know if uh, that's ever happened. Well, but, that, like, but that brings up a question of why do why do people disagree and how do people disagree about poli why is politics so why is the thing you're not supposed to talk about at least one of the things politics it's politics and religion yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think one of the interesting questions about why people disagree which I think you and I have discussed some on past episodes is this question of our our disagreements our political disagreements say about fundamentally different views of the world. And fundamentally different views of what's morally permissible and what isn't, or are they about what we call the empirical question? The factual like, disputes. Yeah. yeah. So, so we both think that you ought to help the poor, but what we disagree about is whether free markets and the sorts of charity systems that arise within them are more effective or less effective than state-run welfare programs. But what's really frustrating often in political debates and I think this is one of the reasons that you don't talk about it um, is – I mean so the reason we say you don't talk about religion is because religion is like this central to a person's identity, to their, their sense of self and so to discuss it, which discussing it means to argue about it. I mean that's what we're talking about here um, is, is to to some level question a person's very identity and the problem with politics is that in – in the way that we engage in politics in this country, it ends up looking like religion, right? Like it's not 
we we don't say like, look, we both agree on helping the poor is the right thing to do. Now let's talk about the best way to do that. What we think is that, look, if you say that the welfare state is bad for whatever reason, it must be because you are a moral monster because you don't want to help the poor. And so it uh, – political discussions immediately turn into the same th thing as religion where we're questioning each other's moral character. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that thinking philosophically allows us to do that the training yourself and having the kinds of arguments that follow along philosophical lines is to say like, look, no, we can, we can have this conversation without it turning into me judging Matthew as a bad human being or as fundamentally flawed or thinking that Trevor is a, a monstrous person or that ev only people who agree with me can be moral saints. But that brings up the question of, of the sort of performative element of politics too. Uh, maybe most people who have political opinions haven't really thought about them philosophically. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a rather cynical view. I mean, maybe it's true, but uh, but the the funny thing is, is I mean, anyone who had done some sort of uh, basic philosophy would hear a statement like, "Well, you don't support welfare because you don't like poor people," would immediately think, "Oh, straw man," or you know, if it was would immediately there's you know there are there's a, a kind of a great list of uh, things you're not allowed to do in philosophy, and it yeah, avoids. Can you tell us what a straw man is before we continue? Uh, oh, sorry, on, we're going to do um, so. Straw man fallacy is misrepresenting. Um, the target. It's pretty of, much. It's pretty much half of the words spoken in this town. I would imagine. Well, sure. Yeah. Um, it's not. I mean, it's a different fallacy to ad hominem, which is you're just insulting the person. That's right? the other half. The other. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the the thing is that you hope that if people were thinking philosophically, that those sort of things would not happen. That these sort of basic fallacies would not occur. But anyone who has lived in this town or anyone that enjoys outside of the beltway watching cable news will quickly come to realize that this is um, the norm, not the exception, which is a great shame. Well, let me – then why is it – so you could say if people are going around not thinking scientifically, it's because in large part maybe they haven't gotten – they haven't been trained to do it. Just like if people are you know bad at playing the piano, it's because they haven't learned to play the piano and if you taught them, they would. Is that what's going on here? Is that that people are from a philosophical perspective arguing poorly because they haven't been trained in philosophical thinking or is it because there's something about the debate in Washington or the nature of political debate I think it's the second that, one. that pushes us to not do it? What so, we would call the right way. So that that reminds me of something uh, that was written by our colleague Brink Lindsay in his book Human Capitalism, uh, where he uh, discusses this instance of a anthropologist or a scientist going to Soviet Russia and talking to a few peasants, and he posits uh, the following, you know, basic thought experiment, which is, well, there are no camels in Germany. Berlin is in Germany. How many camels are in Berlin? And I'm sure basic logic, basic logic, logic problem, and I'm sure most listeners would immediately think, "Well, none." But it turns out that a lot of uh, the, the illiterate peasants said, "Well, I mean, is Berlin a big country, uh, a big city, or is uh, I mean, is, do they need, do, do, camels, do they need there? camels? Are there merchants?" Uh, and no matter how many times this was repeated, there was some sense in which that they couldn't grasp it. Uh, so maybe it is the case, uh, <laughs> and that's obviously an extreme example. But maybe if you're not taught to think this uh, particular way, that it is difficult to come around to it, especially in a context where you're encouraged to dislike your opponents instead of just have an honest disagreement. Well, I would, I would, I think that's there's partially true to, truth to that, but uh, I think that there's a lot of costs to thinking philosophically about things. Social costs. Um, there's a lot of social costs to saying in some cir circles that the other side has not bad arguments. Uh, you, you can imagine this in a religion. I mean, Aaron's analogy of religion was was good. If, if you're living in a Southern Baptist community and you say at dinner because you've been thinking about the arguments and you're not – you're only thinking about the arguments. You're not attacking people. You're not trying to perform morality in a certain way. You just say, you know, actually some of those evolutionists, they have some pretty pretty good arguments. That, that, that has a lot of social costs there. People like to be part of a group that signals their participation in a certain sort of I, – I guess would be the, the – commitments of the group such as are, are, do you believe in the welfare state or do you not believe in the welfare state and sitting down and being like, OK, well, it's a very complex issue. We have to look at all sides and analyze whether or not the arguments are good on these side, especially in this town. All the forces that you mentioned push against thinking philosophically. They push towards performative morality 
which is performing the kind of the, the, the necessary genuflections to the things that your group thinks are important and matter and uh, and then rallying up the troops for your group on one side, which is why it's very hard to go on Fox News and say, well, the Democrats have a really good point here. You're probably not going to be invited back. Performative morality is one of the most distressing things that we see playing out in – I mean it plays out in political debates here but it's also a part of the the bizarre anti-free speech, free thought culture that's on American campuses now that this is this – I mean if morality is ultimately about questions of what ought I to do or what kind of person ought I to be? What is what is the right kind of person, the best kind of person, the best action to take? Um, and what performative morality ultimately says is that that doesn't that doesn't matter at all. What matters is do other people think I am the kind of person who they think is a good person? And so it's entirely based on just I mean cultural conceptions that could be it's it it, it says that we shouldn't evaluate those. That, that what matters is just being in line with certain expectations. And so this is how you get. You know, there was a. I saw a news article just a week or so ago about hybrid cars, and it said you know it looked at the lifetime amount of pollution they generate, amount of energy they consumed from the manufacturing process through the life of the car, and said you know that if you live on the East Coast because presumably the energy economics on the East Coast are slightly different than they are elsewhere in the country, then buying a new hybrid car is actually worse on all these measures than a regular style car. And what that ought to say is if you care if – you, if what you actually care about is protecting the environment and we'll stipulate that you know this sort of emissions reduction all that is actually good for the environment long term or whatever. But if what you care about is protecting the environment, then you should stop having – a hybrid car. But of course, no one who has a hybrid car is going to do that because buying the hybrid car is not really about protecting the environment. It's about or at least for some of them. But, uh, but it's it's all to, I mean what it's what's motivating it is we want the people around us to think we're the kind of person who cares about yeah. the environment. And and that comes back I think to libertarianism because that turns political beliefs at least to some degree into what I would call indexical uh, meaning or like we're they're relative to your position. Uh, and there is a thing about libertarianism where we're talking about philosophy here, and we're prone to be thinking a little bit, possibly more coldly, less group oriented, less rah rah rah, red team, blue team. I think you know more awkward people at libertarian conventions and parties. Something that we know a, a lot about. Maybe we are those awkward people, and and so you draw this in. But the question is: Is that merely a product of libertarianism's fringe element by itself? That uh, that it draws a certain type of fringy people who like to be outside of the group or to tell all the other people that the that what everyone else is doing is crazy. And if it was in Soviet Russia, the fringe people would be different. So the fringe always changes. The fringe who, where the fringe is, but maybe the fringe always attracts a certain amount of people who like to think about who are less into the group dynamics, less into the performative morality, more into the philosophical thinking, more into the sort of like extreme counterculturalism of saying I'm just sort of. Saying a pox on both your houses, whatever those houses happen to be. I, when I first came to Cato, I was asked as a new hire to attend this series of intern seminars, which is every intern class. They a couple of times a week, all the interns go and listen to talks and have Q and A sessions with various Cato scholars on the topics that they do here at Cato, and it's a good way for new employees to get up to speed on what everyone's up to. And so I was sitting in, I'd sat in a handful of them, and I realized that. I felt somewhat uncomfortable. Um, I, I couldn't. It, I was thinking, like, why? I feel I feel a little bit uncomfortable in this room listening to this conversation. And after thinking about it for a while, I realized it was because I was in a room where people were agreeing with me, broadly speaking. That 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 signaling was in line with my beliefs, right? And that coming from, I mean. Trevor and I both went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado um, and that is a place where there – I mean surprisingly are not a lot of libertarian students. Um, and so we were used to being the people with the weird views, used to being that guy in class who always had to argue about 
the particular topic because we disagreed and that was what I was used to and it's – it was it was this very bizarre experience being around a bunch of people who agreed with me and I think that was – I mean going back to what you said about the fringe movement, like I think that obviously the way you don't end up in a fringe movement we shouldn't say fringe movements doesn't calling it fringe doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean all of us think we're we're right. Like libertarianism is is correct, right? But it is clearly a fringe movement in American politics. Um, well, believing in markets in Soviet Russia was a fringe. Yeah, movement exactly. Or, and in, but in, that or in North Korea, that's a fringe movement too. That you don't end up in a fringe movement unless you are at some level not all that concerned about fitting in. About having sure. your beliefs applauded by everyone who's around you. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, going back to what Trevor said about you know, the, the or, and what you've said about the fringiness. Uh, people, I, I think libertarians have an undeserved reputation as being logic machines who are very hard in line because I, I, I you know, don't know a lot about a lot, and you know, sometimes here at Cato, I'll walk around the offices to ask a question about something on policy or economics. And I mean quite often the the two honest responses I get from colleagues are things like it's complicated or I'm not sure or that I don't, I'm not aware of the data. And I think there is a certain uh, humility in what, you know, not, not just Akedo, but I think most people in policy have is, uh, you know, worrying about data rather than the politics. Uh, but I think uh, it's something that, that people have pointed out to me as far as uh, fringiness goes is it's not just that libertarians tend to be fringy about uh, politics, also a little fringy when it comes to music tastes or they're very into, um, you know, gaming culture. And Polyamory. Like, probably, but yeah, there's, there's <laughs> there are, like sub, these subcultures uh, – if, if that's a fair way to describe them, uh, you know, seem to um, coalesce uh, around you know not just politics but other sort of things. So, how do you when you when you're doing your work at Cato, or any of us are doing our work at Cato, and and we're taking our philosophical toolkit, which we haven't totally explained uh, yet about what that entails, uh, something about clarity and thinking about. Uh, what there is and how you know and what you do about it um, and then looking at a problem that someone comes to you and says, OK, here's a problem that we have. You're doing body cameras and policing. Right. Which is currently what Matthew is working on. Uh, how does philosophy inform something – a question like that when you're first asked to look at it? So I think uh, I can start with uh, an example from the philosophical toolkit which is the uh, – uh, I suppose the best way to describe it would be argument from authority is that I'm very aware wh whatever I read, I, I make sure to uh, read widely and to look at data and I, I don't – I try and keep as objective as I can. I don't think, oh, you know, I want to find – what do people who I'm friends with say about this? What do people who I agree with say about this? What, what are the police saying about this? What are libertarians who have already written a bit about this saying? Uh, and trying to make sure that, you know, the – the view is wide and that the data is taken uh, with as little bias as possible. Uh, but then there's also a philosophical baggage uh, that you bring to the tables to a certain degree, which is you know, given Cato's outlook, what is given the data and given our outlook, what's the best policy prescription? Uh, and that's you know, just step one of what becomes quite a long process if you're in, engaged in uh, a report or a white paper or something like that. But are there are there philosophical concerns at play or what sorts of philosophical concerns are in play in the question of whether cops should wear body cameras? Oh, sure. So that, that brings into uh, the rights of citizens. Uh, it also uh, transparency and accountability, the role of government uh, when it comes to keeping people safe, uh, enforcing rights uh, – sorry, not protecting rights, not enforcing them. Uh, there's also concerns about uh, regulations of uh, – regulations as they relate to the making of these things and how much they cost and tons and tons of different things. Yeah, It reminds me of uh, a similar thing for me is when I deal with uh, labor union regulations, for example. Um, I have to think back to first principles and especially in the law that so much of this is based on first principles, uh, philosophical principles about what labor unions are allowed to do and that we kind of take this for granted that labor unions, at least in non-right-to-work states, are allowed to take money from workers who are not members of the union in order to fund the labor union's activity. And they can do that because they've essentially been delegated the power to tax by the government. Which is which gets us back to the role of government and the strangeness of what's going on. That they're very there's a huge aberration here. Government has this extremely 
distinct and unique ability to tax. We can talk about whether or not it's OK and all these sort of things but it has the ability to tax uh, based on majority vote for your own good type of question. And then the question is could they delegate that? Are they allowed to delegate that? So we think about the first principles and say, well, the government can come, come down and take a group of uh, workers and delegate to them the power to tax so they can better represent the workers. And you look at the arguments on both sides. Say, well, the union has to represent all of the workers so they should be able to take money from all the workers so the workers aren't free riding. And you say, well, that doesn't really apply to other situations. It doesn't really apply to the AMA or the the trade association of booksellers or something like that where you say – so the booksellers, they, they do a lot of things to help a lot of booksellers but they are entirely a voluntary organization. They have to raise money voluntarily through book sales and so they don't have the ability to tax bookstores that are not members of their union because they simply say, well, you're benefiting from our representation so therefore we're going to tax you. You have to go back to these basic principles of why are they allowed to tax people um, and is is that a justified use of state power in the role of government to start thinking about the question? And I would say a proper, like, organized type of way. I should. I mean, here I'm the odd man out because what I do at Cato when I'm not running libertarianism at org just is philosophy. I don't do policy, so I'm I'm stuck in the first principles all day. But I thought maybe what we could do is take a first principles argument, one that we'll, – we'll pick one that's popular among a lot of libertarians and talk about it, how we would talk about it philosophically um, to maybe give a sense of what this toolkit would look like. And so what I have in mind is the popular non-aggression principle or non-aggression axiom as it's sometimes called and this is this is the – for a lot of libertarians, this is the, the – Er moral theory. This is the the foundation from which an entire political philosophy flows, um, and it's it's one that functions to use Daniel Dennett, the philosopher Daniel Dennett's term, as a universal acid. It's you know you have this principle and it can address everything. Any question can be answered this way. And what the what the non aggression principle says is that it is morally impermissible. It is always wrong to aggress against the person or property of another. And Unless your life or rights are being violated. Yes. So, right. Yeah. I mean, but a, so that would be one of the questions, what does aggression mean? Does aggression right. bake in sure. that, you know, is it is responding to aggression itself aggression? But the point is you we are always prohibited from aggressing against the person or property of another person. Um, and that's it. And it's it's often presented as there there you go there's the foundational principle but we we've run a handful of articles over the years on libertarianism.org saying that the non-aggression principle isn't really an argument it's it 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 doesn't get there it doesn't quite work that way I mean I think our colleague Julian Sanchez had a piece where he said um, it's it's not even really a principle um, so. Let's start with if, if we've got this argument in front of us. Someone says, look, I'm going to justify my political beliefs by saying that it is always illegitimate. It's always morally wrong to aggress against the person or property of another. Um, how do we start evaluating that? Uh, well, I mean well, for, for, for first I have to uh, – the, the concepts there are not clear. Well, that uh, was the uh, – property, so what's aggression? Persons, yeah, so aggression. we have uh, terms that need to be defined here. So there's not only um, – well, there's aggression but there's also uh, morally impermissible uh, and what that means. Uh, and then you know, once – even if you have the terms carefully defined, uh, the, the way to test whether a moral theory is particularly useful is to take it to its extremes and see if it still holds water. And this is not something that you would do for the non-aggression principle. You would do it for deontology or consequentialism or any of the other moral theories out there. Uh, and this is – you know, a lot of the criticisms of the non-aggression principle come down to this because you'll have people saying – you know, if someone says, I believe in the non-aggression principle and it is the axiom that is the bedrock of my political philosophy then you can come up with uh, useful tools called thought experiments that are, are designed to test the boundaries uh, of arguments. And for something like the non-aggression principle, you could say, so you're thrown out of a 20-story building and there's a flagpole. Are you allowed to grab it to save yourself even if it's privately owned? Uh, should a parent be allowed to uh, you know, not feed a child in their own private home? Can uh, you shine a laser pointer at someone's house? Right. And also how high does – 
uh, property rights go. If you own a house, do you own all the air uh, up for how high? Uh, and then there are also problems with you know pollution that are very well documented. Yeah. That's well, what you do. That's one of the knocks against the non-aggression principle is that it's I mean it was say it's it's parasitic upon a theory of property, mm. and so we can. We can, it can be an argument that everyone accepts, no matter your political views, if you differ on your definition of private property. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to you can't you can't simply assert that you know property equals what I think property equals, which is this strong libertarian Nozekian sort of pro property. Therefore, the non-aggression principle applies because or or leads to libertarianism, right? Because you first have to establish the truth of this particular conception of property. And so you could have an alternative conception of property, say, that says that because we operate in a community, because we benefit from the actions of others, some portion of the property we own or the goods that we generate or the money that we earn is already owned in common. And so taxation, which is one of those things that you know, the non-aggression principle, if it's if it's an axiom, would you know, it seems to just make taxation completely impermissible. I mean, it would be to take your money and taxation would be to aggress against your property, right? Um, but if if it's not your property to begin with, if I'm just taking as the government or as the society that portion that belonged in common, then the non-aggression principle would appear to allow for taxation. So we have to. We have to first get to a theory of private property. The other question about the non-aggression principle is I think it's related to what Matthew was saying about um, can we use a thought experiment? But but there's a there's a contrary view that how much do these really help us uh, actually scope out something that at least seems to be clear for many, if not most, situations. Do we need to answer a question like can I grab a flagpole for that to be meaningful in, in some way? And then the, the second question is sort of very on the Rothbard type of scale, which is – I mean Rothbard seemed to be very concerned with the fact that if you didn't draw completely absolute lines that were that were ones and zero, binary lines, uh, that, that this is aggression and this isn't aggression, this is uh, – this therefore means it's impermissible. It doesn't matter how slight it is, it doesn't, any of those things. Then you would be inviting the kind of gradual erosion of the principle just by not drawing an absolute line and saying, no, you can't you know, pull, pull a hair out of my head but or any of those things. This is his concern. I mean he, he has famously – let's call them controversial views about children hmm. and what parents are allowed to do or not do two or four of their children um, and he ends up arguing say that because a baby is ultimately the property of its parents or certainly not the property of anyone else, that it is – if, if I as a parent wanted to leave my child on the dining room table inside my house and let the kid starve. I can't, I can't actually physically assault the kid because that would be an aggression but I'm not, I'm not obligated to provide for the child um, and so I could let the kid starve. Which sounds pretty bad, but I think what sounds worse is that you would be – it would be per impermissible for you to come onto my property to save the child because you would be violating my right in my front lawn and my front door and the inside of my house and my dining room table. Um, and and we're not this, going to have a balancing test about yeah, and that. And this sounds bad, but the, one of the reasons that he makes this argument is because of precisely this, this slippery slope concern, which is, look, if we don't have these absolutely strict property rights, this like very clear, here's what's permissible and here's what is not. Um, and I should, be, I should be clear that he, he's careful to distinguish moral from legal. Mm -hmm. So he would say it, it could be morally monstrous for a parent to do this, but it would be still impermissible for and it would be a rights violation for the parent for the state to come in and take the child. But his concern is that if we allow it, if we allow this abridgment of property rights, um, then we end up with the state saying, oh, well, you failing to give your kid uh, education of the kind we like is – similar enough to starving them that we're going to force you to educate the kid in a certain way. We're going to force you to inculcate certain values that we find really important. Um, and so we can't open that door even in the slightest. And this does seem to be a, I mean, an issue in, in philosophy is how strict do these rules need to be? How much predictive power do they need to have? How certain 
do they need to be? How much wiggle room can they allow? Could, I mean, could this this seems to me to be possibly identifying for some people what they have a problem with in philo philo philosophical discussion. Uh, that if we're sitting here in a let's say a libertarian party, or a, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure other people have these conversations too, um, and people for the three hours are talking about whether or not that example right there or the light, the light post example or a laser pointer sign on your house, that they're, they're just sort of ruminating on angels dancing on the head of a pin when we all sort of morally know uh, that, that those are very exceptional circumstances. Maybe our moral principles should be based off of exceptional circumstances. Maybe we should just use them as presumptions, which itself is a metaphilosophical sort of theory about the value of theory. But that's what they're really upset about is that people talk about this and everyone knows that it's the case that it's fine to save that baby. So why are we even talking about it? Yeah, I, I think anyone who's engaged in uh, philosophy or political philosophy, maybe even especially, is you know, I, I, if you if you reach a conclusion which is morally repulsive, then it's okay to say I'm going to re-examine this. There's not a there's nothing wrong with that. It's not cheating. Uh, but does that to seem say, to does that seem to put the cart before the horse though? Because it, you're basically just trying to come up with a theory that aligns with your pre-existing moral intuitions. Uh, so that might well. Be true. So you so you could come to a conclusion which is like actually you just got to suck it up and you know our moral intuitions are not logical. And Peter Singer. Got to, Peter right, Singer. Well, yes. so that, that so this so, is this yeah. is the argument. My uh, libertarian moral assistant editor Grant Babcock is sitting in the control room right now, and we have long had this argument. He's a fan of this Peter Singer article that that says, look, intuition should play the the notion that it seems wrong. You know, which is how we do a lot of moral arguing. We say like this seems to lead to a conclusion that it is obviously wrong. So therefore, there's something wrong with the argument. Let's revise that we have no reason to trust our moral intuitions and that what we need to do in Singer's case being a utilitarian is we need to accept strict utilitarianism that says the right action is always whichever produces the most happiness. This might include euthanasia uh, and killing babies and all sorts things of like things. This might and, not be intuitive either. <laughs> and that, that you know, even if we think it seems intuitively wrong, if we've argued correctly for the principle, then that's that's where we are, and that's what we should accept. Is that 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 I, I've I've often wondered this. Um, a lot of philosophical discussions end up in a, a similar type of thing. If you're trying to define art, or let's say you're trying to define science for a philosophy of science class or aesthetics philosophy class, and the debate will often go: Here's what my theory of art is. And then someone else says, ah, but by your theory of art, the Mona Lisa is not art. And we, since we know the Mona Lisa is art, you must go back to the drawing board and come up with a theory that includes the Mona Lisa to which the person who created the theory could either say uh, – they could bite the bullet, be like, you're right. The Mona Lisa is not art or they could be like, ooh, well, that's a problem. I need to go back and make sure I have a theory that identifies the Mona Lisa as art, which just sort of again seems like you're just trying to draw borders – that you can state around things that you already believe in for possibly non-philosophical reasons and that's really true in ethics to some degree. Uh, and but there might be another reason to care about intuitions in politics though, which, well, we is, that, see which is that no one would follow those laws. Yeah, we see so this play out in purely the, pragmatic. the inequality debate. I mean we – so one, when people talk about you know, income inequality is awful. We need to stamp it out. We need radical redistribution and all sorts of policies to – flatten the, the the spread of wealth in the country um, and we, meaning often libertarians, say, well, hold on, but why? We say first off that inequality is not as big as you think it is if you control for things like cost of benefits and so on and so forth. But even if it's there, why is this bad? Like it, you know, it doesn't seem to make – the poor are getting richer. The rich may be getting richer at a faster rate but the poor are still getting richer. So if they're getting richer – you know, we one thing if the rich were getting rich by stealing money from the poor, but um, so that doesn't seem to be a problem, and we can't necessarily trace you know actual harms like as income inequality goes up, we don't see you know well being, however you measure it, go down like all of these things. Why? And the response is is a form of yeah, but it's just bad. Like there's just something wrong about some people having a whole lot more than other people. 
it's a very hard argument to really well, I mean, if they think that. Sure. Well, this so on Trevor's point, I mean, Jonathan Haidt, the, the uh, you know, psychologist, I think at uh, New York-based university, I forget which one, uh, but I mean, he you can go to I think it's yourmorals.org, and you can take this long questionnaire about your your opinions on certain moral statements, and you know you can chart out. People have very different. Some people are very pro fairness, and some people are very pro uh, anti. Uh, you know, tradition, and they don't really respect authority very much. And I mean, so the the controversial statement might be something like: some people, in view of their genes, are more likely to value fairness or more likely to uh, value uh, individualism or whatever. Uh, but I don't, you know, most libertarians I know, and if I know their families, I'm skeptical that uh, <laughs> libertarianism is uh, or moral philosophies in general are genetic. I think there is something else to it. Uh, but you know, it might just be the case that some people just have yeah, but gut reaction that it's difficult to argue. But can we do anything about those values disagreements? I, I well, mean, let me uh, let me can give we try my, and rectify them in some let way. Let me give my quick critique of of the your morals thing because I think that. I think that it sometimes gets – I want to say it gets misread. I want to say the study is I'm going to say potentially poorly designed um, and that in fact the conclusions that we draw from it, which is that – I mean and these – the articles about this show up, have shown up quite a lot, um, it, that libertarians care less about fairness than other people. We care less about authority than other people. Sanctity. Um, yeah. We you discussed. Know, that – that these things, the, these basically these virtues that you know, I mean, maybe the authority isn't a virtue. I would argue it's not, but the, you know, the fairness, the beneficence, and all of those that libertarians score poorly on it. And the the way that these tests work, and this is where I think it goes, it goes wrong in how it judges these things. The way that these tests work is, first, you you go to the website, and it's fascinating. I encourage all of you to do this. It's really interesting to take these tests. It's yourmorals.org, I believe. Um, is you first you self identify. You say. I am a progressive, I'm a conservative, I'm a libertarian, I'm very libertarian, whatever you self-identify. And then you take this series of moral questions. They're not political questions. They're, you know, they're straight up moral questions that are are things like, you know, do you have the I don't know if the drowning baby version shows up, but things like that. So, you know, you're walking by the stream and there's a child drowning and you're wearing really expensive Italian shoes. Do you have a obligation to ruin your shoes in order to save the child, um, yes or no, and and then questions about disgust. Mm -hmm. um, like there's one about they eat the family dog after it's died and do you think mm -hmm. that's permissible or not? Um, and what I – what struck me with this is that because the way that these tests work is you self-identify first by choosing from a list of political philosophies, you go into it thinking, OK, this quiz is in some way about politics and libertarians because we live in a world where the question is always like should we make the state do this? You know, we've identified a problem. Like it's it's never it's never should the state do this. The question in Washington is always is this a problem or not? Because if it is then the state should do something about it. And so when we see these questions then like should you sh save the drowning baby? I, I know that I did this and I would imagine that a lot of people who took it did think, oh, and this may be subconscious, right? But think, oh, this is this is actually a question about politics. And so what this question is really about is would it be okay to force you to have a law saying you need to save this this child or that you could be punished for not? And then the answer becomes a political question of, yes, I think that I have a moral obligation to save the child, but I don't think that laws that would require it mandate it are wrong and so it colors the answers that we give uh, because we're th coming at it from within a political viewpoint. So I think that that's um, a, a few interesting critiques there uh, and uh, but but what I would say is uh, even if that is true and that people do come in with this uh, unacknowledged or unrealized political uh, baggage, I think most most listeners and certainly I think uh, both of you guys would agree that I I've met people throughout my life. This is totally antidotal, but another fallacy. Uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, that people I've met uh, who seem to, for whatever reason, not particularly care about authority. They don't see what's wrong with just not talking to family members or respecting the traditions of the family. And then you see other people who are, um, you know 
know, easily disgusted by things and people who for whatever reason do value um, egalitarianism and equality very, very strongly. Uh, and you know, that might be for – and oftentimes not even related to politics. It will come to you know, a pizza delivered to the house. Does everyone get one slice or do pe- – or is it uh, – should you do what your parents tell you just because they are your parents? Those sort of things are really interesting to observe, particularly I think in kids. But uh, I don't think um, even outside of the Jonathan Haidt work, I think uh, most people listening will have firsthand experience of the differences that people have when they approach morality. But does it, what is this, where does this leave philosophy? Um, I mean one thing you can conclude from Haidt's work and other types of moral political psychology work is kind of what I was saying before. You arrive at conclusions for that would be non-rational – not necessarily irrational, like right. non-rational reasons. It, biology could be part of it, uh, since since political opinions are quite heritable among, and identical twin studies. And then you rationalize them after the fact. So what, when we try and do philosophy on these things, and we start talking about the non-aggression principle and all these things, we're just looking at a bunch of people who have different scales of values. Maybe we can tell them that they're wrong to value X, Y, or Z uh, or maybe values are not amenable to being wrong or right and then they try and come up with a theory for this. But at the same time, when I deal with my labor union exam- example, for example, like so I don't, I don't need to fully explain whether or not grabbing the light post outside of the window violates a non-aggression principle to have the more mainstream example of that – this seems to be aggression, taking money from people force, forcefully. Uh, it's a presumption against that, which I think is safe to say. I don't need to ex- explain all of the uh, extremities of this. I don't need to explain whether or not I'd tax people if an asteroid was going to hit Earth tomorrow or conscript them into building a giant space laser. All those things don't undercut the basic quotidian kind of questions that we deal with. And so therefore, philosophy doesn't seem that useful, correct? I have – I think I have an answer to that or at least a way to think about that question, which is first I would say that in my experience, people's values, the, those underlying values differ less than we're led to believe, um, especially we're led to believe by people engaged in politics um, because I mean if you're trying to win an election, you know, there's you, – you, a big part of that is getting – is motivating voters to go out and vote. And if you say, "Look, my opponent and I, we're we basically, you know, I mean, we have the we have the same values. Um, we disagree on some of the policies, but we both, you know, we'll look at the evidence because they always say they'll look at the evidence and do whatever works best." Um, then that's that's a harder sell for like why this is really important that you come out and vote and make sure that this other guy doesn't win. And so instead, what you say is, you know, he's. He's this radical anarchist who would destroy society because he hates all that's good and pure. So Mitt, and Ro- Mitt Romney was that, that way, right? Was what of course, Romney, right. Yeah. And, the and anarchist Barack Obama versus the socialist. Was, yeah. Barack Obama was this like secret Muslim fundamentalist socialist who hated America because of colonialism and wanted to destroy the country. Um, and these are, of course, absurd. But you know, just like Coke and Pepsi. You have to spend a lot of time distinguishing themselves from each other. Um, you you have to do that, and so we get we get told that these differences are bigger than I think they actually are. Um, and then I would also say that if the differences are not quite as big, although I think they're genuine in a lot of cases, um, then the value of this stuff it's not. First, we all we all have experience of people changing their mind. You know, yeah. I mean, I I'm looking at one right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I had um, I had a certain set of views and I changed them, um, and it was due to argumentation. But that that even if it's hard to change your mind, um, and it should be like you shouldn't just radically change your mind when every argument comes along. Um, but it's it's hard to do. It's a slow process. But if our values are closer than we might think, then reflecting on them. Which is and reflecting on whether the actions we take are actually compatible with those values, advance those values in the world, um, what the what the what follows from those values. Like you say, you really care about respecting everyone, but is doing this actually respecting them? Um, that I think we can we can affect genuine change on the margin um, by just asking people to consider their moral beliefs, consider the effects of their actions and that's where this toolkit of, of philosophy that we've been talking about 
I think is so valuable because it's it's a way to do that, to think carefully about our own views, the views of others, examine them in ways that are fair, um, are to the extent possible unbiased. Mm -hmm. And also to avoid making you know bad arguments. Uh, I think that the distancing yourself from your own arguments, in, in, which is sort of weirdly metaphorical, but there is a theory about – there's a, sort of an idea of philosophy um, is kind of like a successive – uh, almost like conical uh, progression through meta beliefs. Um, uh, the idea that you have a primary belief, um, like that's that is blue, and then you have a belief about that belief. Like I believe that that is blue, or I have I am now believing things about the fact that I believe that that's blue, and you can keep doing that until you're thinking about the nature of believing and all these things. But but one of the observations has been made before is that the philosophers are really looking for what Spinoza would have called subspecie aeternitatis, which is the view from infinity or Thomas Nagel had called the view from nowhere, which is the idea of what does the world look like if no one is looking at it. If I'm like, so I've, I've thought about something being blue and now I've extrapolated it back till I'm trying to think about what the world looks like from nowhere. What you can't ever get to the nowhere position, especially if you're a Kantian. But if you start thinking back behind your beliefs, your beliefs and your beliefs about your belief, I think you can start being a little bit more fair to other people who believe different things. If you just believe on the primary level, like if you just have a very primary belief that that's blue and you're not really thinking about how you believe things, then it's very di difficult to understand how someone else might think it's green and then the dispute is sort of strange. So if you think about your beliefs and you think about why you believe your beliefs and how other people might believe their beliefs in, cer in a certain way for certain reasons that are that are not because Obama's a colonialist oppressor or whatever they might believe anti them an anti-colonialist oppressor. Well, one of the things that I always try and find is I always try and make sure that I'm not using words to describe people that more or less they would never use to describe themselves. So like the word brainwashed is a really good example. No one would ever describe themselves as brainwashed. It doesn't mean that doesn't exist. But when you say someone else is brainwashed, it's a very just sort of primary thing as opposed to thinking about your beliefs and how you believe them and then giving respect to other people's beliefs, which I think is a good thing that you get from philosophy. Well, I, something that I, is sort of interesting uh, working here at Cato with, with libertarian philosophy is that you, you realize that these disagreements are made worse by this thing we call politics, which is, you know, in the world, if there are some parents who want their kids to be taught, you know, Latin at school and some people don't, you know, in a libertarian society, that's not really a problem that the parents send their kids to the school that teaches Latin. And if some adults want to smoke marijuana and others don't, then we don't really have a problem, right? And this, this thing of the introduction of this thing, uh, you know, of politics, uh, and, and I know both of you have said many times that it makes us worse, uh, and I think this is a good example of that. These um, these disagreements become worse than they have to be in this uh, context, uh, which is you know very regrettable. Uh, but those sort of conversations can become more civil outside of politics. You know, I would love it if there wasn't a Department of Education, and I could walk to my neighbor's house and say, "Hey, why doesn't you know Jimmy go to a school that teaches Latin?" And that would just be a different conversation than it is now. God, you'd be an annoying neighbor. Oh, Peter. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, See, Matthew's dad is a, cl he's a classics professor, so he thinks right. everyone, I think everyone should have to speak Latin. I'm willing to tax all of you to teach. <laughs> yeah. uh, but my, I suppose the underlying point here is that uh, that there are there is a way to make these disagreements worse uh, and and bad in in poor taste. Uh, but you know where we could just use the philosophical toolkit instead of uh, you know the prism of political communication. <laughs> Well, here's a knock against the philosophical toolkit, or a possible one, because we've been we've been pretty pro philosophy for the last hour. Is philosophers don't agree? In fact, they disagree deeply. Every every year, every so many years, there's this survey of the beliefs of professional philosophers, philosophy professors, and they'll ask, you know, do you believe in this particular theory or this particular competing theory? And I know that in in the moral philosophy field, there's I think four broad categories that they give. There's deontology. There's consequentialism. There's um, I think contractarianism is on there, and there's virtue ethics. Um, and which one of these do you fall into? And if I remember correctly, it's 
a really big chunk are consequentialists, a really big chunk that's about the same size are deontologists and then smaller chunks are virtue and contractarians. But these are people who – I mean these are PhDs in philosophy. These are people who have spent their career learning and applying this toolkit that we are saying is so useful in talking about issues, in, in really getting to the heart of the matter and yet they disagree. These are fundamentally incompatible theories. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, there, that this sort of reminds me of the question of is there such thing as philosophical progress and I think there absolutely is. Um, there is that's writ large. Um, even though they disagree, they, that's how you build things up. But there are writ large philosophical progress. A, a classic example would be uh, the free will debate. Which for a really good philosophical debate, and I mean like over you know a century and over many different people, uh, will clarify what you're actually talking about. And the question of do we have freedom goes back thousands of years. But then that became refined to based on people having the discussion, what would it even mean to have freedom? And how are we even asking the question? Are we, do we not even understand the question? And then people started talking about that until we had actually created progress for refining what the question is of are we free into a far more sort of looking down and figuring it out. And then secondly, there is a lot of personal philosophical progress. And for I think all of us personally, if you engage in philosophy, you can personally grow in the in the field of realize that things you used to believe and you should not believe them anymore, and it making a, you. A a better, more coherent person, hopefully, uh, than you were before. That's very valuable too. Yeah, uh, I mean, this reminds me um, that well, listeners should know that I I did uh, my my philosophy degrees at the University of Reading, where a f philosopher called Galen Strawson works, and he actually is someone who doesn't believe in moral responsibility, and I suppose thinks earthquakes are as responsible as murderers when it comes down to it. Uh, and and there are you know error theorists that are sort of on the fringe, uh, I suppose. Um, but what I do think is is worth pointing out is even people who disagree about these sort of issues, we've moved on, and this sort of I guess dovetails what Trevor said is uh, it's un it's not often heard in philosophy seminars like we that we have discussions on slavery from a consequentialist point of view or a deontological view we all there is some sort of you know widespread acceptance that you know which took thousands of years for us to get to the point that basically slavery is wrong no matter what sort of philosophy you decide to apply to it uh, and that is progress of a kind i think uh, but i know you know there are people certainly would disagree with that so as i said at the beginning we in this room there's three of us and there's four philosophy degrees because matthew you've got two of them he has to show sorts. off of course <laughs> uh, but that's I mean getting a philosophy degree uh, is it's it's quite a commitment um, not just in time but there's you know you're giving up and you, tweed jackets too yeah yes. you could have gotten an, the pipes mm -hmm. could have gotten an MBA in that time or something that's going to be considerably more lucrative uh, but so outside of doing that you know if we if we think if we we agree that there is a value in understanding philosophy and thinking philosophically and knowing how to have arguments in this style and evaluate arguments in that style. How do we learn to do that? I mean this goes back to the question I asked again at the beginning of decoupling the tool set from the content of it because people have had all of these crazy ideas for thousands of years that fall within the genre of philosophy. So is is the way to begin, you know, like I want to learn to think like a philosopher so I can have better arguments about politics. Does that mean going back to the pre-Socratics and reading about how all of the world is made out of water? Um, and then just working our way through to the present day, is that the way to do it or is there is there a way to maybe accelerate the process? I mean there, there are a number of different ways you can teach philosophy and one is you know, chronological like you point out. I'm kind of a fan of that method uh, maybe because uh, you know, I wasn't taught that way but I have a bit of a soft spot for the Greeks. But I think you know, start at the beginning uh, and, and I think – but you don't have to you know, read every one between – uh, Aristotle and Wittgenstein, right? But there's a good way to start with the the person that started it all, which you know, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, that said, I think if you're talking about like toolkits and logic, I mean, there, there is you know a book I think we give all the interns here at Cato, Logic Made Easy, uh, that they're required to read. Uh, colleague Jason Kuznicki, I think, gives a lecture on all that. Uh, there are tons of good introductory books when it comes to things like logic and critical thinking, uh, and also great books on uh, introductions to major philosophers like Aristotle, Kant, and some of the people we've been talking about. I think that. Uh, that's also time consuming and, and all of us have done th those things. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to care um, about being clear 
uh, trying to understand the, the questions that are out there in the world about uh, the, the difficulty of knowing things to being true and maybe your perceptions aren't true. Uh, maybe they're somewhat deceiving you. The difficulty of knowing what sort of things there are in the world and of talking about them so you can actually try and communicate using precise language like when I was talking about green, being like, is it in the world or what do you mean by in the world? Well, the first thing is you have to care about making that clear. Like what is the world here? I mean my brain's in the world. So it would be like, OK, when, if you're going to have a conversation about where green is in the world or where moral truths are in the world, you have to be able like, okay, in, okay, what's the world and like and what sort of thing is it and then care about having that kind of conversation and then hopefully if you can find people to talk with and you can have – you can build that kind of toolkit with a feedback like Aaron and I have done for 15 years. I like build that kind of feedback loop where you start caring about taking hard questions and trying to deal with them seriously which is fundamentally what I think philosophy is. And I would just say that – even simpler than that, even simpler than, than approaching all of these questions at that really deep fundamental level and walking through all the pieces of them, that if nothing else, I think what the, the philosophical toolkit teaches and encourages is a sense of humility about our own beliefs is, is that what I think is true may not be, that there may be good arguments against it, that things that I think aren't true, people may have real arguments for those. Um, and so to approach when someone says something to you that you disagree with, you know, you hear an opposing political view, just think for a moment as Deirdre McCluskey says often, consider that you might be wrong. Um, just, just take – stop and say like, well, let me listen to this and let me examine my own beliefs. Let me just not assume the truth of them but say why do I believe these things? And I think even that small process of just assessing – why do I believe this? Are my reasons good? Um, why does the other person believe this? Is, it, is there a charitable way of reading their view as opposed to just thinking they're evil or stupid? Just doing that gets you a long way towards employing this toolkit in what will be a fruitful manner in improving the way that you engage with politics. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.